Well, welcome back. We're now talking about the building block of most cultures, and that is something called language. You know, it's very hard to study a culture without knowing that language. Um, in fact, I was struck as I was taking my daughter on college visits that one particular campus has a mandatory language requirement, but you can also satisfy some of the language requirement by studying the culture of that place, even in English, um, because of the intersection between language and culture, you know. So many concepts are contained in the language of a culture. I mean, there's that stereotype about, you know, the Inuit have how many words for different kinds of snow and whatever. Um, and we, I mean, we use the word love for so many different things in English. You know, you think about the love that a parent has for a child. That's different from the love a child has for a parent or that loving partners have for each other or that a love that a teacher might have for a student or a student might have for a teacher or that friends have for each other. Um, or the colleagues might have, you know, we, we might say, I love you. And, and, and we say, I love food. We don't love food the way we love people. So some words carry a lot of baggage and some words are very, very specific. Um, I did a funeral earlier today, actually, and I talked about the Yiddish term machatonim, which is also a Hebrew term originally. And the machatonim are people who are related because their kids married each other. So my parents, related to my wife's parents, they are machatona. They are related because their kids married each other, because chatan is a, a groom, chatuna is a wedding. So because of the wedding, they are wedded to each other in some way. There's no one phrase for that in English that I'm aware of, but it adds a kind of resonance to it to use the Yiddish term for that because it's specific. Or think about terms like chutzpah, right? That you could say chutzpah, as I heard uh, Al Gore do once in a speech when he was trying to pander to a Jewish audience and he had no advisor that could have, have corrected him. It, what was funny is he was speaking to a Jewish audience, so half of the audience said chutzpah. <laughs> they, they had the chutzpah to correct him uh, and how to say it correctly. So th the point is that language is a core part of culture. It would be remiss of us not to talk about languages when we're talking about varieties of Jewish culture. Um, and to do that, we have to go back to the earliest Jewish language that we know of, which is Hebrew. But even Hebrew has its own evolution through history. Um, remember that Jewish identity itself wasn't originally a religious or a religio-cultural identity. It was a national identity. They were the Judeans. They lived in Judea, and they spoke Judean, which itself was a language emerging from the Semitic setting. So uh, you have a number of different peoples in the area around the time that the Judean kingdom emerges after the year 1000 BCE, including the Canaanites, uh, also sometimes called the Phoenicians by the Greeks because of the color purple dye that they would uh, make. Um, there are also Arameans who spoke a language called Aramaic. Uh, you can think of Arabic as well. These are all part of the Semitic language family. So whether you say Shalom or Salam or Shalom, they're all related languages with a slightly different accent. And we're familiar with French and Spanish and Italian as a language family or German and Swedish and um, uh, Norwegian and, and English, to, to be fair, um, as Germanic languages at root. Um, so this is another language family, the, the Semitic languages. Now, the name for Semitic actually goes back to the Noah genealogy, because remember Noah, who's the father of all people after the flood, has three sons. He has Ham, he has Yafet, and he has Shem. And so then there's a whole group of people called the Shemites that come out of Shem, including Eber and Ashur, the Assyrians. Um, now, where Noah diverges from real history is that Ham is the cursed son who sees Noah naked, and he is described as the father of Canaan. So the Israelites, when they wrote their mythological history, made the Canaanites so far back foreign and enemy that they had nothing to do with the Shemites. But we found the Canaanite culture, we found its archives, its language, its writing, and in fact, it turns out it's a Semitic language. And not just a Semitic language, it is most likely the ancestor of Hebrew culture itself. That Hebrew culture emerges in the hill country of the land of, sometimes called the land of Canaan or today uh, modern Israel. It emerges in the hill country where the Canaanites are the coastal plain settlements. And uh, the, the cultures are very similar at an earlier stage and then they gradually diverge in their practices. For example, do you have pigs or not? If you're a nomadic pastoralist, uh, community up in the hill country, you're not wandering, with, pigs are not, you know, migratory animals, um, but they are, they do work for settled farms on the coastal plain. So that's one case where the cultures divert. Language is another example where they split. 
Um, and we'll see an example of this uh, in just a minute. But the first attestation we have of a specific language being applied to this people comes from the Hebrew Bible in the historical books in the books of Kings. Here we have in 1 Kings chapter 18, a description of the siege of Jerusalem under King Hezekiah, which takes place around the year 700 uh, BCE. Um, and during this siege, um, the emissary from the Assyrian king, Rav Shake, comes out to meet with emissaries from the Judean king as Jerusalem is being besieged. And Rav Shake gives a lot of threats to them and a lot of threatening language. And then here in verse 26, the emissaries from the king say to Rav Shake, this official, Daberna el Avdecha Aramit, speak to your servants in Aramit, in Aramaic. Because we listen, we understand Aramaic. Don't speak to us in Judean. Remember, Judah is Yehuda, so Yehudit would be Judean. Don't speak to us in Judean, but in the, in the ears of the people on the wall. In other words, let's use the international diplomatic language of Aramaic. We're civilized, we can speak that. Don't say it in Hebrew because the people on the wall might understand all your threats and that will undermine our negotiating position. And so Rav Shaka answers them, this is in verse 27, was it to your master and to you that my master sent me to speak these words? It was precisely to the men sitting on the wall who will have to eat their tongue and drink their urine with you as they suffer in the siege. And so then he stood tall, the Amor Rav Shake, but Yikrab Kogadol, and he spoke out in a loud voice, Yehudit, in a loud Jewish voice. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. He spoke out in a loud voice in Judean, right? Or in Hebrew. Notice it's not called Ivrit here, it's called Yehudit, it's called Judean. Now, the concept of, uh, or the phrasing of Ivrit as Hebrew um, has to do with a self conception of the Israelites of having crossed over. Avar is to cross or to pass over. So think about the Exodus narrative where they cross over the Red Sea, they cross over the Jordan River to enter the land. So they are the people from over there that have crossed over. Um, but its original name for the language as testified in these historical books is Yehudit, is Judean, not necessarily. Uh, well, yes. See, what happens is the people that had been there. there. See, the theory is that there was a, a, a Levite or a priestly tribe that may have wandered through the desert, but not all 12 tribes as described in the narrative, but they sort of fuse their national stories into one national story. And so it becomes accepted as the general terminology for the language and the people. But it may not have even been a common term uh, for their language until after the exile, when they were the people that passed over and came back. And so that's also, you know, that might be also when that national identity of the wanderers uh, fits in because they're going back to the promised land. You know, when, when history repeats itself multiple times, you begin to think, hmm, maybe maybe one's a story and one is the historical experience and they're trying to project back the story. Uh, for... Oh, uh, Judean? No. Is, is, oh, uh, the Hebrews or the Ivrim. Ivrim, like Ivrit is the language, so Ivrim would be the Hebrew, the people that crossed over. Well, and as we'll see, B and V in Hebrew are interchangeable letters. Um, yeah, I was going to say, just like in Spanish, where what we would write as a V is pronounced often as a B. So, yeah. So that, that's the word for Hebrew. Well, nowadays, it would, um, let's see, let's say, they wouldn't really use the word, yeah, they would use Ivrim if you're talking historically. You wouldn't use it referring to the people today. But Ivrit is either the adjective for Hebrew as an adjective, or it's the name of the language, Ivrit. I, I, I speak Hebrew. Okay, but in the early period, it was uh, Yehudit. And then Aramit, Aramaic, Aramaic or Aramean, was the international language uh, that covered parts further east. Um, later on, um, it will become uh, Greek, will become the lingua franca in the Roman Empire, obviously. Um, so there's already a concept of some people are able to speak more than one language. I mean, multilingualism is not new. Right? We know that in ancient times, it was very, very common. Um, the other interesting detail that we found is through archeology, span where we found examples of writing. Now we haven't always found full documents, but we do often find um, inscriptions. 
Um, so you might have um, little uh, uh, bullet or small uh, clay bags of symbols that would be collected. Or um, you would find uh, uh, tablets or uh, pottery that was written on. So we can get a sense of what the alphabet was around this time. And I will also point out that the whole concept of an alphabet is a Canaanite innovation. So when you were writing in Egyptian writing, that's called hieroglyphics, right? So you have symbols that represent ideas, but sometimes in picture writing, which is also true for Mesoamerican picture writing, the pictures represent the sound. So if you're trying to you know, present an abstract concept, sometimes you would pay, take symbols that represent the sounds of different things and put them in sequence and that becomes the sound of the word. Well, what happened in writing in Mesopotamia in the Middle East initially was something called cuneiform writing, which was done with a reed stylus. And a reed, you can either put it the long way for a straight line or push the end in for a sort of triangle shape. But the kind of writing that developed for the Babylonians and the Assyrians and before them, the Sumerians who really invented it was what's called syllabic writing. So you would have one symbol that would be a ba and one different symbol would be a bow and another symbol would be a boo. And then you'd put these syllabic symbols together and then you would create language out of it. Um, so it was representing sound as symbol in an abstract way, but it was more complicated because you had all these different symbols for the different voweling. What uh, made Canaanite such a useful innovation was the fact that it um, put it into abstract symbols for the sounds and the vowels were separate. So um, you had all these consonants and then the vowels could appear uh, sometimes as letters as later alphabets do. Uh, in Hebrew, actually, the vowels are not written in standard written Hebrew, as we'll see a little bit later. Um, in Aramaic, the world? Uh, in Aramaic uh, no, in Aramaic, they're also as a separate set of symbols. I'll, I'll, show, the, I'll show you that uh, alphabet in a minute. So if you look at the top row, you see very abstract symbols here, right? I mean, this sort of looks like a, a cattle here. Uh, this is a square. This is a fish, you know. Some of these letters seem to be looking very different than what we're used to seeing uh, in the Hebrew alphabet, which you can see further down after row nine, that's the sort of standard modern Hebrew letters. Um, but what happened over time was symbols, which the, uh, the um, uh, cattle had uh, stood for ayil or um, uh, a male uh, uh, bull, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, they, uh, they evolved in writing to be more abstract and eventually to sound symbols. And you'll see this goes back to 1500 BCE, this idea of an, alif, an alphabet. In fact, notice the word we use. In Hebrew, it's aleph bet, but we say alphabet. Um, and in fact, Greeks modeled their alphabet on the Canaanite alphabet, because in Hebrew, the first letters are aleph, bet, gimel, aleph. Not A, B, C, D, but A, B, T, D in our phonemes. And what are the four what are the first four letters in Greek? Alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Right. So it doesn't have the C sound there, it has the D sound there, but that's following the Canaanite alphabet. Um, so actually the Greek alphabet evolved out of that. So Hebrew clearly evolves out of um, uh, out of the Canaanite language and Canaanite alphabet. However, its alphabet looks very different. If you look at row seven, for example, here are examples of Hebrew inscriptions with the um, early version of Hebrew alphabet that was being used. And you can still find a few inscriptions of these, you know, floating around somewhere. Uh, but in general, it's not as common. The letters that we're used to, see, sorry, which one? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't read this thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's the number seven, uh, row seven is uh, from Arad and Palestine, early sixth century BCE. So we're talking. 500, right, right, around the time of the second exile, right. Um, now, what's fascinating is that alphabet begins to change in Jewish usage um, because it actually gets merged with the Aramean or Aramaic alphabet. The letters that we think of today as Hebrew letters originated as Aramaic letters, and the Jews copied it, guess what? When they were in exile in Babylon, they're living under the Babylonian empire, What's the international language of the Babylonian and Persian empire to follow? Is Aramaic. And so they pick up that alphabet and begin writing their old traditional language in this script. In fact, there are even debates 
in later generations, we're talking now 100 BCE or around the year zero, among rabbis saying, if you write a Torah scroll in the old script, does it still count? They're familiar with this old Hebrew script. They've seen it before, but they know that the newer script, the Aramaic letters, are, uh, are the ones that everyone's using now. Uh, so this is one of those cases where the language itself evolved and how it was written. Um, this chart, by the way, is in the Eli Barnavi Historical Atlas book that was one of the core textbooks for the Jewish history class that we did uh, previously. So uh, if you do happen to have it from that class, um, it'll be in there. I'm sure you have a lot of books. <laughs> right. Now, the other thing that's fascinating about Hebrew as it evolved over time, of course, is as Jews were living under the Persian Empire, they began to speak Aramaic as their daily language. Um, so much so that we have testimony of Jews speaking Aramaic every day and even translating their Bible into Aramaic. Uh, there's a tradition called the Targum, which is the Aramaic translation of the Bible. And um, in some synagogues, there, there's testimony or um, accounts given of people reading the Bible first in Hebrew, and then they read it in the Aramaic so people will understand what's being said because they don't even understand the Hebrew anymore. Uh, we know that in the Greek diaspora, they also didn't understand the Hebrew anymore, which is one of the reasons they translated the, the Hebrew Bible into Greek, but becomes the Septuagint, the basis for the uh, Christian Old Testament. Um, but as Jews begin to speak Aramaic in their daily lives, um, and one other, uh, sorry, one other piece of evidence for this is um, the words of Jesus as recorded in the New Testament, where he's on the cross and he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, but he's quoting it in Aramaic. Uh, and that's, you know, the, those are his supposedly his direct words transcribed and uh, in, actually transliterated in the Greek uh, originally uh, from what he well, supposedly said. Yes, you get a few words here and there in the book of Daniel is where it really shows up. And Daniel is dated very late yeah. uh, to around, let's say, 200 BCE or a little bit even more recent than that. Um, and what happens is actually uh, sort of funny. A character begins talking in Aramaic and then the book just continues in Aramaic for the next several chapters until it gets to a new chapter and then start. So and then uh, so it just sort of switches back and forth without real rhyme or reason. The first fully Aramaic targum, uh, targum I'm guessing um, like the first century of the Common Era. Uh, I'm not positive. Again, a lot of these are oral recitation things, not always written down. Um, the first written targumim, I think, are around that time period, but I don't, I don't know exactly. Um, I you said no, I, I didn't mention specific. Here. The Dead Sea Scrolls are written in Hebrew. Yeah, those are in Hebrew. Um, and in fact, one of the uh, example scripts that it showed you was from the Isaiah, one of the Isaiah scrolls that was found from the Dead Sea Scrolls community. And it's very similar. I mean, a modern Hebrew uh, reader totally pull up the Dead Sea Scrolls and read them. Um, it's, if you look at the row nine here, these are square characters from Isaiah's scroll, second century BCE. So this is in the 100s BCE. And you can see comparing that to the modern Hebrew script, it's not identical, identical, but it's very similar. It's very similar, right? And also when you look at the Hebrew Aleph Bet, as we'll, we'll look at it in a little bit, um, the, um, the letters often are symbolic of uh, particular words in, uh, in, in Hebrew. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a couple examples of those as we go. But what I wanted to clarify first about Hebrew, as it worked in most of Jewish history, was that it was not used as a daily language. Right From the time they started speaking Aramaic, that was their daily language. So much so that by the time they wrote down the legal discussions of the rabbis in the Talmud around 500 of the Common Era, it was mostly in Aramaic, or it was actually in kind of Hebraic. It was like a blend of the two. And if you, if you ask an ultra-Orthodox yeshiva student um, to split out Aramaic and Hebrew, they wouldn't necessarily be able to do it because they study it all as one body of literature and don't parse out which is which. To, they just see it as an alternate form. So Aramaic, for example, um, in Hebrew to say the, you put ha in the front of a word. So uh, av is father, ha'av would be the father. But in Aramaic, instead of putting a ha at the beginning of the word to say the, you put an aleph at the end of the word. So if av is father, the father or dad is abba, with an extra aleph at the end. So you're still adding a letter to mark the direct object, but it's a different letter in a different place. In the, so it's a slight difference. And sometimes the plurals in Hebrew end with an 
eem ending, where in Aramaic they end with an een, with an n ending instead of an m ending, but it's still an eem, some kind of sound like that. So there are subtle differences like that that mark the, the two, um, but they're again in the same language family. It's easy to, to jump back and forth. Um, so Hebrew did uh, preserve itself. It was continued to be used as a distinct language, but only for certain areas. It became, in Hebrew, you'd call it a lot, uh, Lashon Kodesh, a holy language, sort of like Latin in middle medieval Europe, where um, it was spoken and written by the elites, and it was used liturgically, but it wasn't something that the common people understood. They had a vernacular that might be very different. So um, it was used for Jewish law. It was used for prayers. It was used for reading the Torah every week and literature. Um, at a certain point in time in the medieval era, it began to be reclaimed as a kind of classical language. We saw examples of from medieval Spain where they were writing Hebrew poetry, sort of in competition with Arabic poetry, um, but they were creating new stuff in Hebrew, not just the old stuff. And over time, there have been uh, pious poems that have made their way into the prayer book. Or if you celebrate Passover, a lot of the later songs and pieces in the Passover Haggadah are things that were added centuries later, but in Hebrew. So who knows one and uh, one little goat and, and so on. Uh, it's another example, by the way, the word for one in Hebrew is achat, uh, but in Aramaic it's chad. So it's chad gadya, which is one little goat, as opposed to, you know, gdi uh, achat, uh, which you would say in Hebrew, it's an Aramaic song. So again, we imagine it was written in an area where people spoke that language. Okay. So um, where Hebrew changes in Jewish life is in the modern period, in the 19th century. First of all, you have the growth of the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment, where Jews want to reclaim their classical language, just as others are reclaiming their classical language or uh, creating dignity for their national cultures by writing in their own language. Ukrainian, for example, actually isn't written down until the more modern period. Even if it was spoken for centuries, they didn't actually write it down for a long time because it was a peasant language. It wasn't an elite language. Um, and the same is true with Hebrew. You get these Haskalah writers who start publishing newspapers in Hebrew and writing short stories and novels in Hebrew, and nobody can read them because most people, you know, they can recite the Hebrew, they memorize, but they can't create language in it. It's not what they're able to do unless they're at a very high level of study. What really changes Hebrew into a mass language is Zionism, where they want to create a Jewish state and they decide that they want it to be um, speaking the historic Jewish language. And so a man named Eliezer ben Yehuda is very famous for this. In the 1880s, he writes the first modern Hebrew dictionary where he has to come up with all kinds of new words for things. So as uh, two examples, um, the word for a chariot is a rechev. So he had to come up with a word for train and he made it a rakevet. So it's similar sounding word, uh, similar consonant sequence, but uh, modern form. The other example was um, when Ezekiel has his vision of the chariot. It appears and it's surrounded by a brilliant light. It's called chashma. All around it was chashma. But that's a word that only appears once in the Hebrew Bible, so we don't really have context for it. You know, it could be fireworks, it could be, we don't really know. It was often understood as like a brilliant light of some kind. So he made that the word for electricity. It was a word that existed in the Hebrew Bible. Nobody knew what it meant, so fine. Well, so, he, so now he had a plug-in chariot, right? <laughs> um, as we understand it today. Uh, so sometimes you do get these uh, odd quirks um, where a modern reader might read this and say, what, electricity? But it's because of what Eliezer ben Yehuda did to reclaim the language for modern use. And it used to be the case maybe 100 years ago in Israel that everybody on the street spoke Yiddish, that everybody in the university were the ones that learned Hebrew. Uh, but nowadays, in the secular world, you only hear Yiddish in the university and you uh, hear Hebrew on the street all the time. There are you know, cab drivers and uh, garbage men and people doing their business in Hebrew uh, all the time. What I recall was a story where I may have been the guy that wrote it. Um, and, and he was passing a playground and some kids were playing and they were, and the kids swore in Hebrew. And he says, this is when I know I succeeded. Right, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Right. Well, and, you know, they, they wanted to be a normal nation and to use it as a national language. So that was absolutely one of the goals. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you uh, a Hebrew alphabet just so you can see uh, what it looks like. And I'll point out a couple of features of the alphabet. So first of all, you'll notice, why can't I move you? There we go. Um, so first of all, you'll notice, again, you have the different forms. The B and V, as I mentioned, are related. It's almost the same form. The difference is that the B has a dot. 
and the V does not have a dot. Um, and uh, linguistics, I think, is a, a, fric a percussive versus a fricative. So a percussive sound is a right. and a fricative is a v v f like that. And actually, it's the same is true for P and F. If you go down further, this, this letter is either a P with a point or an F with a soft. And when it winds up at the end of the word, it's almost always the soft form. Um, this one is a hard K or a soft H. And again, at the end, it's almost always a H sound at the end. Baruch at the end of the word is always this letter. And then, and Hebrew also has different letter forms for the ends of words, for certain letters. So ones that are commonly at the end will have a final form, like the final Kaf or the final Mem or the final Nun. Why would you have that? Well, if you're writing in really cramped small form, this will help you know when a word when a word ends and when the next word starts. You know, if parchment is difficult to get, if you're carving in stone or whatever, you want limited writing, this is one way to save space, is to have an extra long letter there. Um, you'll notice as well uh, that some of these letters are silent letters. The Aleph is silent. There's also an Ayin, which is silent as it's pronounced in modern Hebrew. In um, Middle Eastern Hebrew, uh, the ayin actually has a sound. It's an ayin, it's sort of a, a guttural swallow. And in Arabic, I understand there's two letters. There's ayin and gayin, which are similar, uh, where in Hebrew, there are only one letter for that two, those two forms. Um, and there are a couple other guttural sounds in uh, Arabic-inflected Hebrew as well. The chet is actually a chet, chet, so you sort of swallow it. Very guttural sound, like yes. Like when I, listen, but I don't understand it, but I hear it all. Right. Right, so the het in Arabic inflected Hebrew sounds more like uh, that guttural sound. In modern Israeli Hebrew, it's, it's, the het is the same as the chaf, and you can't really tell the difference between the two. Um, also, I'll point out there are some letters in Hebrew that have sounds we don't have in English. So chet is one of them. Shin is another. So you have one letter, shin, that is the sh sound, where in English we have two letters for that, right? Or ti sometimes is sh. <laughs> Or, you know, we, we have a, a few ways of writing the same thing. Um, okay. Uh, you'll also notice, obviously, there's a script or a cursive version that's a different column. Just like we have in English, we have cursive writing that's different. One other point I'll mention is that in Hebrew, the letters also stand in for numbers. Hebrew didn't have a separate set of uh, symbols for numbers. We often call these Arabic numbers, although my recollection is they're Arabic via India and then made their way back, some long story like that. Um, but in Hebrew, they didn't do that. They simply used the letters for numbers. So if you wanted to write a number, you would write one letter and then a little like apostrophe mark and then the second letter, and that would stand in for the number. So if I wanted to write uh, uh, 18, for example, I might write the chet and then the yud, which is eight plus 10. That's why chai, yud, chet and yud, or chayim, to life, is thought to be related to the number 18. So when people would give gifts for bar and bar mitzvahs, for example, they might give you a gift in the multiple of 18. 18 or l'chaim to life, right. Because chai, if you made, this is another trick, each word has a number value. If the letters are all numbers, you could take any word and figure out what the number value is and come up with some kind of cockamamie commentary about what that means. There are a total of, I think, 22 letters, if you're not counting the final forms or the dots as separate. Right, the numbers jump. Once you get to 10, now it goes 10, 20, 30, 40. So you get to 100, and then it goes 100, 200, 300, 400. And if you want to do thousands, you just write a, like a, right now the current year is 5,782. So you would write a hey with an apostrophe for the 5,000. Then you've got 700, so you'd have to write a chin and a tav, so a 300 and a 400. Then you need an, a pay for the 80, and then a bet. For the two, so they didn't have a zero. I mean, the, now there's a word for now there's a word for zero, but there wasn't back then. Now I'll also point out in this chart, if you look to the right, here's where you have the vowels as they were developed in the eighth and ninth century, uh, because for a long time it was just written in consonants and you just knew what it was. So I use the example with my students. Um, if I give you the word in English, DG, what word is that? DG, dog or, dig or, dug, yeah, or edge, E-D-G-E, right? 
Oh, yeah. Right? So it could be a variety of uh, words, but if I wrote TH space DG space RNS, you could probably figure out, or the dog runs, uh, or I mean, it could be the edge runs if you're talking about a printer or something, but, but once you start adding words, even without vowels, you can figure out what it is, what it's supposed to be. Um, so that's how Hebrew operated for a long time. But over time, there were some debates over what the proper pronunciation should be. So it's around the eighth or ninth century that a group called the Masoretes developed a fixed text of the Bible called the Masoretic text and a fixed voweling system so they'll be pronounced exactly correctly. Um, so that's where you have the this X just stands in for any letter. So if you had a letter with this vowel sound under it or next to it or, or, uh, or after it, like these O sounds, um, you would just pronounce it the consonant plus the vowel. So if I had a bet with the a ah vowel under it, it would be fa. But if I had a bet with the e vowel under it, it would be b. And that's how you would uh, learn how to read. That's the very basics of the Hebrew alphabet. So is there any difference between the, the first? These two ahs? Yeah. Ah, that's an another subject for debate because the Middle Eastern Jews did not make a distinction between those two vowel sounds. But Ashkenazi Jews in Eastern Europe did make a distinction between those two, where one was an ah and one was an aw. Ah. They had a subtle difference between the two. Uh, so this is again one of those cases where different groups have evolved different meanings for this. We don't know, of course, what the Masoretes themselves meant exactly by them because there's no audio recordings from back then. Um, it's like people who imagine that if you go study the Acadians in Quebec, um, and think that that has a perfect version of French from the time that they split off from mainland France. But it's not true because they themselves have evolved in their own ways through surrounding influences. So it's really impossible for us to know exactly what the Masoretes meant. We assume those two symbols had some version of uh, open mouth, uh, lateral stop, whatever the phrasing is, um, sound to it. But exactly what the differences were originally, we, we can't go back and reconstruct. So I have, I have a simple question. Sure. So in the translation into English, or not, it's not English, but into, into Roman letters, yes. that I can read when I'm singing, right. okay, the songs that you pick, a lot of times it's like an L with an apostrophe or something like that. How do we voice that, that apostrophe? Right. So there is a, a vowel uh, that's the short vowel. It's a silent or a short sound. Usually that apostrophe in the transliteration is when you've had a, a that kind of vowel under a letter. Okay. So it'd be like b. Instead of it's not ba, it's not b, it's not bo, it's b. So, uh, so it's meant to be a short. It's meant to be a shorter sound. Right. That's why we do it with the apostrophe. I mean, there's no perfect way to transliterate. You know, people will say, "What's the best way to spell Hanukkah?" And I say, "Chet nun vav kav hey. Or that's that's how you spell it <laughs> in the original alphabet. But in English, it's, a, it's all an approximation. So how do you want to make a ch sound? C-H or H. You know. Right. And I, I don't like C-H because I my name is with a C-H and I pronounce that like a sh yeah. because it's the French spelling. Because my family went from Syria to Paris and they got the spelling like Chateau Champagne. Right. That's how they rendered the shin. Um, but if you go into English, you write it with an S-H. And so um, I've actually had a lot of Hebrew teachers think my last name is Chalom because they see the C-H and assume it's a ch. Chalom means a dream in Hebrew, so it's also a word. Oh. 